Welcome back. In this lecture, I'll briefly explain Executive Order 12333. It's the most widely used surveillance authority, and it's also the least transparent. Recall that the executive branch has a number of powers related to national security and foreign intelligence. It has long been the understanding that the president has a degree of inherent power to conduct intelligence operations. As for just how much power, well, scholars have devoted entire careers to that topic. The law surrounding separation of powers in the federal government is notoriously ambiguous. For purposes of this course, I'll lay out the general framework that many legal practitioners use when approaching a separation of powers issue. The framework comes from Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company against Sawyer. It's usually called the Steel Seizure Case, for short. The case arose during the Korean War. Steel workers went on strike, threatening the war effort. And so, in violation of federal statutes, President Truman ordered a seizure of domestic steel production facilities. A majority of the Supreme Court held that the president did not have power to order the seizure. It was, therefore, unlawful. As for why it was unlawful, the justices were badly fragmented. So, while the scope of presidential power remains deeply uncertain, Justice Jackson's analytical framework has had lasting impact. There are three categories in Justice Jackson's framework. The first relates to executive conduct that Congress has authorized. In that category, the president's, quote, authority is at its maximum, unquote. If some conduct is unlawful, it's really only because the federal government entirely lacks constitutional power for that conduct. Everything we've seen so far with the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act falls into this category. The second category is where Congress just hasn't addressed an issue. In those areas, the president acts in, quote, a zone of twilight, unquote. The scope of the president's inherent power is informed by historical practice and contemporary necessities. This is the area where Executive Order 12333 provides primary guidance. And this area includes almost all foreign intelligence operations outside the United States. I should note that Executive Order 12333 and related authorities do apply to congressionally authorized surveillance. But since statutes are generally more protective, it's of limited effect. In surveillance debates, when there's discussion of Executive Order 12333 surveillance, that usually means surveillance outside the United States that's not covered by ECPA or FISA. The final category that Justice Jackson set out consists of executive conduct that Congress has forbidden. In those areas, the president's, quote, power is at its lowest ebb. Unquote. Put differently, this category pits Congress's Article I power directly against the President's Article II power. In the years following the September 11th attacks, the Bush administration engaged in surveillance practices that fell within this category. Even the Department of Justice concluded as much. In its view, some of these surveillance practices were unlawful but others were a valid exercise of Article II power. In the mid-2000s, the Bush administration moved away from this category. And in modern practice, there appears to be maybe just one program that still operates in this category. The executive branch calls it transit authority, and it applies to international telecommunications traffic that happens to pass through the United States very little is known about it. Okay, so there's a roadmap through the separation of powers issues associated with foreign intelligence surveillance. 
since that was some murky law, and it's really important. Let me recap. Executive Order 12333 embodies the President's inherent Article II powers. It's the primary authority for surveillance that isn't regulated by the Electronic Communications Privacy Act or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That includes almost all surveillance outside the United States. Most surveillance by United States intelligence agencies is conducted outside the United States. So, Executive Order 12333 is the primary authority for most surveillance by United States intelligence agencies. That's raised a lot of concern. Let me touch on a few specific criticisms. First, there's no judicial oversight. FISA doesn't cover these operations, so the FISA court isn't even notified of them. Second, there's almost no congressional oversight. Members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees have publicly noted that they don't much supervise operations under Executive Order 12333. Third, there's almost no transparency by the executive branch. What's known about Executive Order 12333 programs has come almost exclusively from leaks. Fourth, with information technology, it's easy to circumvent ECBA and FISA. Executive agencies can simply relocate their operations outside the United States, and that way escape the ECBA and FISA protections. For instance, instead of collecting transatlantic internet traffic in the United States, the NSA can partner with the GCHQ in the United Kingdom. The NSA receives the exact same information, but it's subject to a very different set of legal protections. Finally, the same objections to Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act have been raised for Executive Order 12333. Foreign individuals and businesses receive little protection, and Americans are subject to massive incidental collection. Now, let me say a little about the procedures that apply to Executive Order 12333 surveillance involving U.S. persons. These procedures are primarily established in two successor documents, United States Signals Intelligence Directive 18 and Department of Defense Directive 5241-R. Incidental collection of communications to, from, or about U.S. persons is generally permissible. Disclosure and use of intelligence information as criminal evidence is also permissible. Pretty much the only area where disclosure and use is almost always impermissible is when there's inadvertent collection of communications solely between U.S. persons and solely within the United States. The last point I'd like to touch on here is one that seems to have captivated the Internet. The intelligence community has defined the term collection to mean the analysis of information after it was collected. That's certainly some linguistic contortionism, and it enables the intelligence community to underreport how much its activities affect Americans. That said, as a legal matter, it's not clear that this questionable definition really changes the level of substantive protection that's available. The incidental collection rule already allows collection and analysis of information involving Americans. I also want to be sure to note that, while not that many courts have considered this issue in law enforcement contexts, those that have haven't really bought this way of thinking about collection. Now let me touch on the procedures for surveillance involving non-U.S. persons. In January 2014, President Obama issued Presidential Policy Directive 28. That document is the latest guidance for these procedures. So, here are the rules at present. Non-U.S. persons can be targeted for surveillance without court approval. 
And that surveillance requires only a foreign intelligence purpose. That's even more watered down than Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which requires a significant foreign intelligence purpose. There are a few limited protections, I should note, against intentionally using surveillance to burden speech or to discriminate. Under the old rules, before PPD 28, there were even lesser disclosure and use protections than for U.S. persons. Under the new PPD 28 rules, very roughly the same disclosure and use protections apply. Before closing, let me touch on some of the intelligence practices under Executive Order 12333. There's been targeted surveillance, including of foreign government leaders. There's been bulk surveillance, including the entire phone systems of certain countries. There's been hacking into devices, including most prominently components of the Iranian nuclear enrichment program. There's even been hacking into entire national telecommunications infrastructures. In sum, Executive Order 12333 is like the Wild West. It's very open-ended authority. So, that brings to a close this part of the course, on the various sources of legal authority for foreign intelligence. In the next part of the course, I'm going to do my best to explain some controversial NSA programs.